Okrima Media's Policy, I'm Sanel Lamini, researcher and analyst, Professor Raymond Sadna, joins me to discuss his book titled Recovering Democracy in South Africa. Thanks for joining us and congratulations on your book. Thank you very much. Thanks. We know that many authors have written books on South Africa and trying to offer solutions to the problems that we are currently facing. What makes your book unique? Well, every book is unique, uh, but it can be uniquely boring, or it can be uniquely interesting, uh, or it can be unique in uh, a sort of plodding way. What I, I'm trying, I wouldn't have like used use the word unique, but I, uh, I think what I'm trying to do is to understand the current situation in South Africa and in all its dimensions and trying to um, indicate possible ways of recovering the democratic hopes that we had in 1994 and even going beyond that. Um, what is different, I think, from my book compared with many others is that it's not a narrative telling a story. It is telling a story of our unfolding democracy, but its main aim is to analyze and identify the key features that are different from the present period under President Zuma, uh, and to organize these in themes and uh, to indicate whether we should just give up uh, in a sense of hopelessness, which I experience in talking to a lot of people, or whether we should, as citizens, be active in trying to rebuild our democracy. Now, what I've done in the book, um, you know, when you write a book with a number of different essays, you worry, will it hold together as a book? Because I didn't start writing those essays with a view to a book. But what I think the book does is it identifies a number of different themes. And all of these themes, I would argue, are interlocked elements of the current uh, political order under President Zuma. On the one hand, there is a disrespect for constitutionalism and legality. There is uh, an attack on rights to gender equality and freedom of sexual orientation. I also deal with the leadership deficit, the lack of trust in leaders, but I do this partly in relation to what is happening, but partly by drawing on uh, the lessons that can be drawn on some of the, from some of the great leaders in South Africa. I deal with the question of identities, cultures, and customs. And uh, in a final section, I ask what is the route out of the present problems? How do we go forward? What are the resources we can draw on what type of unifying vision should we try to build? Tell us about the title of the book. How did you come up with this title? You know, uh, for this type of book, you can use a number of words besides recovering. You can reuse, rebuilding, reinvigorating, and a number of others. But why I liked the word recovering is that it suggests that there's something that has been damaged or lost. But when you say recover, you also indicate that maybe we can get it back. But uh, I also try to argue in the book that we're not trying to go back exactly to 1994, because maybe we have learned things uh, since then. And the concept of democracy and, f and the concept of freedom, for me, 
are not static concepts. They are ever-evolving, changing concepts. And we may have new ideas about building this democracy beyond where uh, we envisaged in 1994. But for a start, we must get back the rights that have been undermined since then. As a person who's participated in the liberation struggle, how do you feel about the level of crime and violence in our country facing us? And where do you see the country headed in future? You see, uh, I don't think the level of crime uh, is something whose cause can be put purely at the door of the government of the day. We're in a society which um, has rapidly changed just in terms of influx of people into the cities. And there are not facilities for all the people who've come to the cities. So you have a very high unemployment rate, and I don't think that's entirely uh, to be put at the door of the government. Mm -hmm. But when people are unemployed, they're hanging around in places that are not proper, uh, uh, not proper settlements, not proper towns, not proper villages. Uh, and um, the level of provision of basic facilities to people has not been adequate. They're not playgrounds for children. They're not recreation facilities for those who are unemployed, who are hanging around. So that this is not um, an environment which is conducive for people to discuss how they can make the environment look more attractive. Because in some of these areas, you've got sewage flowing in the streets. So that in the 1980s, when we had what I would, would describe as the popular power period, you had strong communities. Now. In some of these places, communities have not really been built. Or where there were communities, they've more or less eroded in this period. So it's quite um, difficult to say, um, you know, to relate my being in the liberation struggle to what I think of crime. But I think the question of violence is something that's important because on the one hand, South Africa was conceived in violence. The country uh, was created first as the Union of South Africa through the conquest of the African peoples. And the whole history of South Africa politically has been one where people have preferred to acquire things through force of arms rather than through negotiations and debate. And when the liberation movements took up arms against apartheid, that was also a form of settling a matter through the use of force. And I think we have to ask ourselves whether all the parties to the conflict in South Africa have done enough to secure peace in South Africa, to instill in people a sense that nonviolence is a virtue. And I think that's one of the things that I try to deal with in the book, that nonviolence is seen by some people as not really revolutionary. But you know, when you're trying to build peace, and people want peace, they don't want to be dying all the time. And we need to encourage that. But I think it goes beyond the question of politics. I think the overall culture in South Africa is one where people address issues of disagreement through the use of force. Road rage or mm. uh, aggression, which you find in shops and a number of other places. And I think a lot of this has to do with the type of models of manhood that we have in South Africa today. We need to look at those and try to encourage ways of being men and boys which are less aggressive. And in the book it shows that you have a great deal of respect for President, the late Ma Nelson Mandela. Do you think the, pre the politicians of our time can learn something from him? See, my respect for Nels President Nelson Mandela 
is not one which is um, something static where I look at and use words like icon. Mm -hmm. I see Nelson Mandela as a man who changed a lot during his life. And I think that is a very important thing for all of us to learn from. That Nelson Mandela was not always the kindly gentleman who would be smiling and sh uh, hugging and shaking everyone's hands. As a young man, especially when he was in the ANC Youth League in the 1940s, he was very aggressive and he was very fiery. And in the 1950s even, Nelson Mandela also, by the way, was a boxer. Mm -hmm. And he used to break up meetings of the Communist Party and the Indian Congresses. So he was a, quite a rough politician. And although he is associated closely with Oliver Tambo and Walter Sisulu, they were more mellowed. It took Mandela a long time uh, to mellow. And in the 1950s, he was often reprimanded because he, long before the ANC decided to take up arms, Mandela was more or less advocating it. Although together with Sisulu, they had inquired whether the Chinese would provide arms. This is before MK, long before MK was formed. But uh, it was only in the period of prison, I think, that Mandela, as he says, he matured. I'm not saying he was immature before then, but he was a bit impetuous, ready to shoot from the hip, uh, ready to fight. And I think the period in prison was a period where he thought about his life, thought about how, what he would do when he came out. And the greatness of Nelson Mandela is that he understood that there is a time to fight, as the MK Manifesto said in 1961, submit or fight. And they were not prepared to submit. But there's also a time for peace. And when he saw the possibility of peace, Mandela bent all his efforts to making that peace succeed. When he came out of jail, he was very determined to reassure any people who could potentially pose a threat to the peace, particularly white people. And that's why he did some of these things like visit Betsy Fivort or wear Springbok rugby jersey. Now, some people have contempt for that. In fact, when I was around, I was not uh, really happy about that. But when I think about it, mm. when I think back about it, I think it's part of Mandela's greatness that he came out and he planned what was necessary to ensure that a peaceful democracy was secured. And overall, you also support the idea of a united front, but you feel it needs something more. Please elaborate on that. Well, that is in relation to the present. If we want to rebuild our democracy, recover our democracy, mm -hmm. it's very important to ask ourselves, who is suffering under the present situation? And while I don't accept this idea that nothing has changed since apartheid, mm -hmm. a lot of the people who are suffering today come, f or the majority come from the black population of South Africa. They are the people who are dead on the ground from police bullets. They are the people who are unemployed primarily. They are the people primarily who don't have water, housing, and all of this. But we have to ask ourselves, <coughs> who else has reason to require, to want restoration of democracy, constitutionalism, and legality? My view is it's not just the working class. It's not just those people who believe in Marx, Engels, and Lenin. It's the poorest of the poor, but there's also sections of business, church people, other faith-based organizations, and civic-minded people who I think should be drawn into a united front. And the united front should not just emphasize working class issues. It must emphasize the broadly poor people uh, who are suffering in shacks, 
without water and a range of other things, but even the middle class and others who want to see democratic rule. And there was this part in the book that interested me a lot, where you speak about the Zuma era. You mentioned that people who are voting him in power, who keeps him in power even today, they have this feeling that if he falls down, they might also be going down with him. But is it likely for us in South Africa to see maybe President Zuma as our president trying to do like other African leaders where they will just prolong their terms just to be in power? Look, I can't um, forecast what is going to happen. Um, you know, I think on the one hand there is a Zuma era in my view, but we should not restrict our gaze to one human being because that leads people to think that if Zuma goes, everything will be solved. Mm -hmm. And I think what we need to understand is that there are a range of relationships that uh, underpin the presidency of Jacob Zuma. And these are relationships of patronage, of corruption, a willingness to break the law, to commit violence, all these things. Now, if someone else comes there, those things are not simply going to disappear. Mm -hmm. So that, that would be one thing that I would say is that let's not uh, think that you need some messianic figure to come in and then everything will be okay. But I said that the Zuma era is unstable. It's quite possible that Zuma could go tomorrow. But there are a lot of people who have their position because of Zuma. There are a lot of people who have contracts because of Zuma. But if they get the impression that the charges against Zuma may be reinstated, or that there is an upswell of opposition to him. For example, in Eteguini municipality at the moment, they are have, that's the biggest region in the country of the ANC, bigger than some provinces. They're having to uh, have elections reorganized mm. because they were irregular, and it indicates that there's a level of instability. You see, the ANC ballooned in membership, especially in KwaZulu-Natal, but there's no evidence that this is a political uh, commitment on the part of these people. People are joining the ANC today in many cases, or I would think even primarily, to get certain benefits because they see today that the way you can get rich is through contracts. You get contracts through the councillor at the bottom or at the level of the presidency through people associated with him. So it may be that uh, Zuma will go, but when it will be, I don't know. Uh, it could be any day, but it could be that he holds out for long. People have to ask themselves, what happens if he falls? Will he take us down with him? Uh, or if we don't get rid of him, will he go? So the answer is not simple. And you were also involved in the struggle in around the 80s, mm -hmm. fighting for democracy. Are you happy with what South Africa has become? I was involved before the 80s. I was mm. involved from uh, my youth, from my school days, mm. and I didn't. I wasn't then in illegal struggle. But I mean, I was in illegal struggle from the late 60s, early mm. 70s. Um, you know, the struggle is not like a business venture, where you invest money and then you see whether you get returns, mm. uh, whether um, your money multiplies. Now, I'm very pleased to have had the opportunity for fight, to fight for freedom. As a white South African, it was very important for me to identify with the suffering of the majority of people, to, to feel, uh, embrace their experiences and to try to bring about change in South Africa and to make my contribution towards that. And the book repeatedly refers to gender and sexuality. 
and you are, there is an entire section dedicated to such information. Why, why, why do you do this emphasis on that? You see, it's interesting that very many people, when they describe the Zuma era, they say, well, this one is likely to become a minister, or this one is close to Zuma, or uh, they talk about Nkandla. Mm. But if you look at the character of the Zuma era, he has, he and the ANC itself, has recast the people who are part of the alliance with the ANC. They've brought in traditional leaders very close to the president. They've brought these charismatic ch churches like Rima. Mm -hmm. Now, all of these are very patriarchal uh, uh, institutions that are not favorably disposed towards gender equality. Zuma himself, when after his rape trial, he would come out and sing Umshini Wam, bring me my machine gun, it is actually a, a phallic symbol. A gun is a phallic symbol. And uh, sending off bullets can be interpreted as ejaculation. So in some senses, that from the very beginning of the Zuma presidency, there is a strong association with extreme form of patriarchy. His statements uh, about uh, you know, women, that they must not uh, have straight hair, they must, should not have dogs, and this is for whites, they're trying to be clever blacks, and all these things, uh, and the only way to be a woman is to have children. There are a number of these things that are characteristic of the era, and I think the danger signal for me is that gender equality and also sexual freedom are under threat. Mm -hmm. And although they are part of the Bill of Rights, some rights seem to be more equal than others. And sexual freedom, the right to choose your form of sexuality, leads to a number of attacks, murders, things like that. And it seems to me also that there is, through the women's ministry and a number of other uh, institutions of state, insufficient defense of gender equality. What can you say about the future of the country? You know, um, I can't forecast the future, but what my book tries to do is to encourage people not to give up on the freedoms that are many people fought so hard to achieve. We need to try to understand. The first step to changing something is to understand it. And I've put forward my form of understanding, and I hope others who share this can find a way of joining together, unified around uh, the values that we cherish in order to try to rebuild this country and its institutions as best we can. Thank you, Professor. This was Professor Raymond Sadna speaking to Krima Media's Polity about his book titled Recovering Democracy in South Africa. <laughs>